Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us at tonight's Mansfield Dialogue, uh, North Korea, Threats from a Failed State. My name is Anna Salyards, and I am a sophomore at the University of Montana. I'm an MUS Honor Scholarship recipient and am double majoring in political science and history. I'm a UM advocate, a member of the Political Science Honor Society in the Davidson Honors College, and a member of the Model UN Travel Team, in which we are representing Bolivia this April at the National Conference in New York. I plan to go to law school. As I've been pursuing degrees in the areas of political science and history, I've discovered the importance of international relations and cooperation, especially in our strife-ridden contemporary world. It is easy to live within the bubble that is the United States and close ourselves off from the topic of global engagement. However, as international tensions continue to rise, it is vital that we educate ourselves on current events. That is why it is my pleasure to introduce Bruce E. Bechtel Jr. and Robert E. McCoy. Dr. Bechtel is an award-winning professor of political science at Angelo State University and a retired Marine. He is also a former senior intelligence analyst at the Defense Intelligence Agency. He is the author of five books, his most recent being North Korean Military Pro Proliferation to the Middle East and Africa, Enabling Violence and Instability. The author of more than 40 articles in peer-reviewed journals, he is a widely sought after expert on North Korean international security issues. Dr. Bechtel has been called on to present commentary to the BBC, CNN, CBC, Radio New Zealand, syndicated nationwide radio shows such as POTUS Politics on Sirius XM, The John Batchelor Show, and several interviews from na on National Public Radio, just to name a few. His current research is on the North Korea-Iran nexus and how it involves weapons development and proliferation to rogue states and non-state actors. Robert E. McCoy is a retired U.S. Air Force Korea intelligence professional who provided <coughs> real-time analysis and aperiodic summaries on North Korean activity. More recently, over 150 of his commentaries on North Korea and East Asia have appeared in various national and international periodicals. He has been cited by the British House of Lords and the North Korean Central News Agency, and he has been interviewed by The Voice of America, Modern Psychology in Sweden, and Vietnam News in Hanoi. Mr. McCoy is also presented on North Korea to American universities and other educational institutions. As a fellow with the Mansfield Center of the University of Montana, his deep interest in the Korean Peninsula and East Asia continues. And with that, I will hand it off to Dr. Bechtel. Thanks, can everybody hear me? And can everybody see me? If you can't see me, raise your hand, that's a joke. So are you seeing the slides right now? I don't see anything up there except a picture of Mike Mansfield. Are they seeing the slides? Bruce, I think they're not yet. Uh, Momentarily. Say, uh, next slide, please, and we should get them uh, up at this point. Yes. And here they are. Okay with an excellent burnt red background. Okay, well, uh, I, in talking with Bob McCoy, who is my new friend, uh, and I guess everybody can see my head at the top of the slide or something, is that how it's working? Um, at any rate, um, the title of my second book was Defiant Failed State, because that's what North Korea is really. And, uh, so that's why I thought we'd talk about that a bit. Next slide. Uh, I'm gonna talk about, whoa, what happened? We just lost slides. Apologies, one moment. <laughs> okay, there's a slide. Um, there's three things I'm going to talk about today, and Bob's going to talk about some of this as well. Um, what's the North Korean threat to East Asia? Um, what's the North Korean threat to the USA? Yes, there is a threat to the USA. And what is our threat from North Korea from proliferation? And a lot of you probably haven't read a lot about proliferation unless you read my book. It came out in 2018. I have another one coming out that talks a lot about it especially dealing with Iran. And um, my portion of the brief will focus on nukes and ballistic missiles because Bob wanted to talk about the other stuff, which I'm happy to, to let him do. 
and uh, it should be interesting. Uh, next slide. So these are the three things we're going to address today, tonight. And I think it is a worthwhile endeavor, as I say on the slide, um, to consider how the DPRK is adjusted to the challenges and the threat that this presents to the RK US Alliance. And when I say adjusted to challenges, I mean a, a teeny tiny portion of what its GDP once was. So many people malnourished that now your average North Korean is half a foot shorter than your average South Korean and, uh, and huge fuel and electricity shortages. Next slide, please. Well, what are the challenges that uh, North Korea faces? Um, inadequate resources, especially food and fuel, limit the training of traditional conventional forces. Why is this a big deal? Well, because in, in North Korea, their military has 1.2 million men. That's in a country of 25 million people. That's a lot. That's the biggest, um, demographically, that's the biggest uh, portion of a country's population in the world, literally. By the way, Eritrea is number two. Um, they must prevent malnutrition and health issues from leading to discipline problems within their military. And this has happened before. Um, inadequate force modernization uh, to replace their legacy systems has been a big issue. For example, the, uh, the South Koreans are now flying F-35As, which is the same thing we fly. Um, they're now flying F-16, they've been flying F-16 and F-15s for a long time. Uh, the, the North Koreans are still flying MiG-21s from the 1950s and 60s. Jet is uh, uh, MiG-29, excuse me, MiG-29, which they got 30 of from the Soviets right before Soviets cut them off in 1990. They don't have enough money to engage in a traditional arms race with South Korea. And to exacerbate this whole process, um, information is gradually beginning to seep in from the South. Why is this a concern? Well, by the time the wall came down in 1989, 70% of people in Eastern Europe said that they were getting their information regularly from Radio Free Europe. That is not something that the North Korean government wants to happen. Next slide, please. So how does Kim Jong-un continue to maintain a credible threat? Well, if you look at the slide here, you'll see some of the ways. Um, some of them look rather primitive. Uh, the answer is asymmetric forces are the highest priority. In other words, not forces that take and hold ground, but forces that can create cracks in South Korean and U.S. defenses, and then perhaps make those cracks open where follow-on forces can take that ground. Um, so we see things such as um, a nuclear program that has gone from a two kiloton explosion in 2006 to a nuclear test that was around 300 kilotons the last time they tested in 2017. Um, that's part of their asymmetric threat. The other part is long range artillery. If you look at that artillery piece up there, that is a 170 millimeter artillery piece. <clears throat> if it looks really, really big, it's because it is. Um, th this was originally built as a naval defense gun by the Soviets back in the 60s. They sold some of them or they gave some of them to the North Koreans. Um, in the late 1980s, the North Koreans put them on T-54, 55 tank chassis. And we said, what the heck are those guys doing? That's so weird. Why would they do that? Well, then they rolled them down to the DMZ and they pointed them at Seoul. Nobody's laughing anymore because they can hit Seoul with those guns. They have a very long range. Um, they also have... Um, and that's just some of their long-range artillery. They've got more. 
Um, they've got ballistic missiles ranging uh, that that have a ranges that go from 300 kilometers, you know, all the way up to uh, missiles that that can hit the eastern seaboard of the United States. And of course, they have special operations forces. Um, in 1997, when I went to work for the Defense Intelligence Agency, North Korea had 100,000 special operations forces. Now they have double that. They've got 200,000. They converted some of their standard foot infantry battalions to special operations forces. Um, this allows North Korea to threaten ROK and U.S. forces with affordability in ways that are highly difficult for us to defend. By the way, that biplane you see there, that is a uh, AN-2. It was, uh, it was first built in 1945 by the Soviet Union. The North Koreans now make those indigenously. Before you start laughing at it, it can carry eight fully loaded combat special operations force troops. And the North Koreans have about 304 of those, give or take. Next slide, please. Well, a big question is, can the DPRK maintain nuclear programs in the face of international pressure? So let me, let me please answer that question for you. Um, North Korea will never, ever, 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 ever give up its nuclear program. Never. Um, the only way they will give it up is if it will mean the end of their status as a nation state unless they do so. It's actually written into their constitution. So I put some of their goals here, intimidate the West in the negotiations of bring concessions. We saw that with the agreed framework in the early 1990s and then with the six party talks in the 2000s. And as I say here, they always in cooperation at the point where vital program elements are threatened, but significant aid has been acquired. In other words, they engage in these talks, they get goodies from us, they get um, easing of sanctions, they get economic support. And then right as we're about to actually go in and inspect their programs, be shut down, then they find a reason to walk away from talks. Um, the figure you see here of six to eight plutonium weapons is very conservative. They may have up to 20. Um, they tested what they claim was a thermonuclear weapon in 2017, never proven. Uh, the most likely warhead they would put on a missile is highly enriched uranium, and they can threaten the entire region. As I, and as I'm going to show you here in a minute, they can also threaten the United States. Next slide. Well, I named off, ticked off some of the weapons that they have. Um, they have scuds that have ranges all the way up to uh, 850 kilometers. Um, the Nodong is a missile that has a range of 13 to 1500 kilometers, which means it can hit Tokyo Harbor from North Korea. They've got at least 100 um, short range ballistic missile launchers, at least 50 Nodong launchers. Um, this is according to the ROK, Ministry of National Defense and the, the US Air Force. Um, they now have a submarine that's called by some the Shinpo class submarine. The submarine can launch a solid fuel missile that can hit uh, Japan, and if they are able to get it uh, undetected towards Hawaii, they have the range to get to Hawaii too. It's got 70 days underwater dwell time. It's kind of a hybrid of an old uh, Soviet uh, submarine that they got for junk. Um, they also have the equivalent of the SS-21, which uh, for those of you who are old like me, remember the SS-21 is the missiles that the Russians had deployed against NATO forces during the Cold War. That's accurate to within 100 meters CEP, which is good. But even better, the North Koreans now have what's called the Iskander, uh, or they have a copycat of it, essentially. Uh, and that's accurate up to 30 meters CEP, which means draw, stick a pencil in the ground, draw a circle 30 miles around. It's that accurate. 
How accurate is that missile? Well, the Russians in recent months have been using Iskanders to actually target individual buildings in the Ukraine. So it's a very accurate missile. Next slide, please. I have no idea how I look because my head is not anywhere in this picture. Thank you, technical people. North Korean threat to the USA. Um, the threat to the USA from, uh, from uh, North Korean ballistic missiles has significantly, significantly stepped up since about 2015. <clears throat> um, and, you know, just to get you started on that, um, on May 13th, 2017, two significant things happened. Um, the North Koreans tested a missile that they called the Hwasong-12 that's capable of hitting Guam, uh, definitively capable of hitting Guam. It's got a range of 4,500 kilometers. Guam's about 4,000 kilometers from the North Korean landmass. That's the first thing that happened on May 13, 2017. The second thing, much more important, is that my daughter, my youngest daughter, my baby, the apple of my eye, the center of my life, graduated from the University of Iowa. Go Hawks! Um, they have also tested a missile called the Wasong-14 successfully that has a range to hit um, Alaska, Anchorage. And as, as many of you probably know, about 40% of the population of Alaska lives in the greater Anchorage metroplex. They've tested many times um, the what they call the Hwasong-15, including yesterday, I might add. And um, the Wasong, and they tested it last week as well. So this is a missile that can hit all the way over to Washington, D.C. It's also a missile that most people assess can carry a nuclear weapon that's, a, that's uh, about 100, uh, excuse me, 1,000 kilograms, which could kill about 160,000 people in an instant if it was a successful launch. Many people who study North Korea saw a missile called the Hwasong-17. Um, the Hwasong-17 has had, at best, a spotty testing record, and uh, it is not considered reliable yet. My old agency, DIA, has assessed formally to Congress that the DPRK can, in fact, put a warhead on an ICBM with the range to target the USA. Of course, my response to that would be, well, duh. Um, so interesting stuff. Three-stage technology um, may or may not be forthcoming, but the North Koreans don't really need it yet. Next slide. Now, I know those of you in the audience are saying to yourself, well, that's, uh, that's great, Bruce, but uh, what if these missiles don't work right? Well, let me be frank with you. Um, North Korea really had the ability to hit us with a nuclear weapon as soon as they had a primitive plutonium nuclear device, which was probably as early as 1992. The reason why is because North Koreans, as I'm going to show you in a few minutes, are very good at proliferation, and they often reflag ships, disguise ships, and that's how they proliferate weapons all over the world, but especially in the Middle East and Africa, getting past not only our safeguards, but those of our allies. They can do this with proliferation. They could also do it with a nuclear weapon and just sail some ship into Tokyo Harbor or Long Beach or Pusan and kill 80,000 people, even with a primitive device right off. Next slide. Well, how do they threaten our interests in the Middle East and elsewhere? Well, in, in the Middle East, as everybody knows, our key ally is, of course, Israel. I just uh, got back from Israel in uh, July. It's a beautiful country. It reminds me a lot of California, the uh, the terrain and the areas around Tel Aviv and Haifa, places like that. Um, Northern Israel, which some people call the Golan Heights, 
I call it Northern Israel. Um, they proliferate all kinds of things over there, both high end and conventional stuff. So let me talk about that for a minute if I can. Um, North Korean proliferation in Syria includes everything you see listed here, which as you can tell from the first bullet on the slide is just about everything. The reason I put just about everything on there is because that's what they proliferated to Syria really since um, the Yom Kippur War uh, way back in the 70s. North Korea proliferated a nuclear program to Syria. They basically built a copycat of their own nuclear reactor at Yongbyon in Korea, in Syria, in the desert. And then they put a fake roof over it so the Israelis wouldn't figure out what it was. <laughs> well, that worked real well. The Israelis took that out in 2007. Um, the North Koreans have proliferated on a large scale chemical weapons and the platforms that fire them. Let me get specific about that. After the Gulf War, uh, when Saudi Arabia uh, paid Syria a whole bunch of money for helping them to fight in the Gulf War, uh, the Syrians used a lot of that money to help buy chemical weapons from the North Koreans and other stuff, Scud C missiles, a whole bunch of conventional weapons, et cetera. Beginning in the late 1990s or the mid 1990s, the North Koreans sent artillery officers every year to train in full mop gear with artillery and with Scud missiles sometimes, because uh, by the way, missile officers are artillery officers in North Korea. Um, every year they would do this annually with the Syrian army using live munitions. Can you imagine, I spent 20 years in the Marine Corps. Can you imagine those of you who are veterans actually training with live chemical weapons? That's just insane, but that's what they did. So when the Civil War broke out in 2012, and the North Korean, excuse me, the Assyrians started using chemical weapons on their own people. It was something they were already fully prepared to do. They already had the weapons. They already knew how to get those weapons refurbished and resupplied because they had the North Koreans to do that. And they'd already been trained on it. So very, very close connection between chemical weapons and the North Koreans and the Syrians. By the way, so you know, between 2012 and 2018, the North Koreans made 39 shipments of chemical weapons to Syria, as confirmed by the United Nations panel of experts. And of course, the North Koreans also have sold the Syrian Scud B, C, and D. Iran is everything. Um, when the Pakistanis were cut off from, from uh, Iran in, excuse me, 2002. There's a lot of anecdotal reporting that points to the to uh, evidence the North Koreans picked up where the Iranians left off. The proof is not as excuse me as strong as one might think, but it's certainly there. Just about every liquid fuel missile that Iran has, they got from. North Korea, and they have also paid for a lot of what Syria has now too. They've been doing that really since about 2010. Um, <clears throat> as far as as uh, ICBMs go, North Korea and Iran, uh, and this just came out, are currently working on an ICBM together, which which really means North Korea is selling it and Iran is buying it. Um, and that, that was just confirmed by the UN panel of experts just within the past week. Conventional weapons. Well, um, the civil war in Syria was a huge boon to the military industrial complex in North Korea, such as it is, because uh, they needed lots of weapons and Syria was getting lots of stuff destroyed. So they needed lots of new stuff. That includes refurbishment of tanks, new tanks, guns, artillery, rocket-propelled grenades, ballistic missiles, and so, and obviously chemical weapons, which they fired largely using multiple rocket launchers. That was our number one uh, uh, platform, 122 millimeter rocket launchers. But they also 
had uh, North Koreans flying helicopter sorties for them. And as you know, North, uh, a lot of those helicopter sorties were just kicking out barrel bombs with chemical weapons on out of the back of helicopters. Um, so very interesting stuff. They also have distributed all kinds of conventional weapons all over Africa, 12 countries. I'll get to that in a second. Um, the machine gun you see that guy firing in the top of the, the slide is an SKS. The North Korean version of that is called the Type 73 machine gun. It's different because the magazine is on top of the gun, not underneath it, which makes it really hard to target in on something you want to shoot. So the North Koreans built it with a sight off to the side. I'm not kidding. And they've sold thousands and thousands of Type 73 machine guns. The Houthis have them, Hezbollah, the Iranians, the Syrians, et cetera. Next slide, please. What kind of proliferation activities? Well, I've described some of it. WMD and the platforms that carry it, ballistic missiles, um, conventional weapon sales of all kinds, refurbishment of Soviet era weapons, for countries that still use them. This is a lot of countries in Africa, but it's Syria too. Uh, technical and military assistance and advising, that's something they've done a lot recently with Hezbollah and the Houthis, for example. And one of the key things that they've done since the 1990s is instead of having to ship these huge systems, whatever they are, whether it's artillery or small arms or missiles, on merchant ships, they build these facilities in places like Iran and Syria and Africa and places like Uganda and Namibia and, and Mozambique. And that's where the actual weapons are assembled, but they get the parts which are strung out over different merchant ships from North Korea and they have North Korean assistance on the ground in these factories. This makes it more difficult for us to, uh, to interfere in their proliferation process. Next slide, please. So this gets back to missiles in Iran and Syria. Just so we know, in Syria, their missiles right now have chemical warheads. A lot of them, some have standard AT. Um, in Iran, the, they have been collaborating, according to several sources, on building a 500 kilogram warhead for a missile that carries a nuclear payload. Um, so next slide. What nations has, has uh, North Korea proliferated weapons to in recent years in Africa? Well, I'll answer that. The, a better question is who have they not been proliferating weapons to in Africa? Because right now it's the number is over a dozen. And if you look up on that list that you see on the slide, the only country up there that has stopped since I wrote my last book is um, Namibia. Namibia has actually stopped buying weapons from North Korea. Everybody else still buying stuff from North Korea. And the reason this is such a concern is because if you look at these countries, none of these places are really very stable. So, you know, North Korea is just helping to add to the instability and violence by giving, selling these guys these guns and, and other stuff, tanks, trucks, uh, anti-aircraft systems, all kinds of stuff, small arms. So, um, you know, the reason these countries buy from North Korea is because North Korea will sell it to them cheaper than anybody else. Next slide, please. Terrorist groups. Who does North Korea sell to that's a terrorist group? Well, a lot of people. They used to sell to the Tamil Tigers. Um, they don't anymore because the Tamil Tigers are no more. Um, Hamas, which exists obviously in, in Gaza mostly. They built tunnels for Hezbollah used during the 2006 war, which made it more difficult for the Israelis to get after them. They have and continue to sell to both Hamas and Hezbollah Lots and lots of small arms and lots of rockets, especially 107 and 122 millimeter rockets. You want to know the difference between a 107 and a 122? 107 goes on the back of a big truck. 
They're longer, they go farther. The picture you see on the left in the slide, that's a 107. That's a very small, has a range of about 8,000 meters. Um, Houthis uh, originally were buying North Korean made stuff or getting North Korean made stuff from Iran. They're now still getting it, but they're also buying that and scuds from the North Koreans. And of course, the North Koreans are collaborating with and proliferating to uh, the IRGC, which is the Iranian Republican Guard Corps, which coordinates all terrorist activities in the Middle East for Iran. Next slide. There is a new form of illicit activity, and I think this is important. I think this is key. Um, this has only been going on about 10 years. Um, and when people first started telling me, Bruce, uh, you should start looking at North Korean use of cyber. Of course, my, act my reaction was always, yeah, cyber, <laughs> cyber. <laughs> but, I mean, North Korea started using cyber pretty effectively in the later 2000s, like around 2014, 15, 16, targeting government offices in Seoul. Um, some of you know about they targeted that, that uh, movie and brought that down. Um, you know, several years ago. But the North Koreans soon discovered very quickly that the, the most effective use of cyber that they could have would be stealing stuff from other people. So they've been doing that. Cyber theft has now become probably North Korea's biggest illicit, excuse me, illicit moneymaker. North Korea probably makes two to three billion dollars a year from Iran and everybody Iran supports, the terrorist groups in Syria, et cetera. They probably make, you know, uh, several hundred million a year off all their African activities. Well, um, when I was out in, uh, in Korea uh, last summer, or excuse me, last October, I interviewed several South Korean government officials who gave me solid figures that since COVID hit, North Korea has made $6.2 in profits from cyber theft. For a little country like that, that's a lot of money. And that does not go back into supporting the people. That's a big human rights thing to me. That does not go back into supporting your people. It goes back into buying weapons of mass destruction, feeding their army, training their army, and getting new weapons that they can threaten um, the ROK, Japan, and the U.S. with. Um, what's really interesting is they run their dirty money that they make through entities in Iran and Syria, banks, cyber entities, and then they get this eventually over to China and to a lesser extent Russia, and, uh, and that's where they, they end up keeping their cyber profits, all dirty money. Um, squeezing North Korea's illicit money laundering is a good way for us to take away resources from their military. So if people were to ask me, well, can sanctions work? Yes, we already have sanctions in place that allow us to go after banks that are laundering dirty money or entities that are laundering dirty money that the North Koreans are getting from proliferation and from cyber. Um, so what we need to do is, what we're not doing now on a large extent at least, is, go, is simply to uh, put our sanctions, uh, enforce those sanctions stronger than we have been and get support of key allies, not just the, the uh, United States and, and, uh, and Japan and Korea, but countries such as Singapore, India, et cetera, that can really help us out. And this will really put a squeeze on the regime. Can we do it? Yes. Will we do it? Have not done it a lot yet, so only the future will tell. But I hope that has opened up everybody's eyes a bit about North Korean proliferation and a threat from that, as well as a threat from ballistic missiles and nukes. And uh, if you want to learn more about how this was going up until about 2018, um, my suggestion would be to go out and buy my book, uh, entitled North Korean Military Proliferation in the Middle East and Africa. And that's available on amazon.com, amazon.com, amazon.com. 
So uh, that's it. I'll pass this off to uh, Bob McCoy now. Okay, well, thank you, Bruce. Uh, you've covered a lot of ground there. And what I'm going to do is cover biological and chemical weapons. But before we do that, I want to address something that Bruce really started the ball rolling on. In fact, get the next slide, we will pick up where Bruce left off. So next slide, uh, it's, no, going back to the one with the map, please. There, that one. That is a map of the demilitarized zone. Uh, that's the little dark orange line that runs from the upper uh, right-hand corner down toward the lower left. Each little red dot represents either a hardened artillery site, that's what HARTS stands for, heart, hardened artillery site, or if it's not an artillery site, it's going to be a short range rocket or a medium range artillery, uh, something of that nature. 6,000 of those are on the DMZ. As you can see from the slide, 4,800 uh, artillery, uh, 1,000 long range artillery and a shorter range rockets. That puts all of Seoul within its sites. And uh, Seoul is in a county called, uh, a, a county, let's call it a county, Kyunggi-do. 50% uh, of South Korea's population is in the greater Seoul area. So 50% of South Korea's population is under the gun, literally. And they use this to blackmail or to threaten uh, the South Koreans. So that's why we just can't take those out. First of all, every country has a right to its self-defense. And looking at it through North Korean eyes, they built that with that purpose. Uh, how they use it, uh, that's a matter of question. Uh, but South Korea is the one that would pay the price if the United States or some other entity were to attempt to take these things out. So if we can, ah, and I also want to mention that those uh, large rockets that Bruce mentioned, 300 millimeter, that's about a foot in diameter, uh, 600 millimeter, that's two feet in diameter. These brand new rockets are now being uh, deployed on, along the DMZ. And in the past, there's been a big distinction between rockets and missiles. Missiles are guided, they have a guidance system. You don't have to simply point and shoot. Rockets, typically you point them and shoot them, and if they get close, you're happy, but you usually use more than one rocket to attack a particular target. These days, these 300 millimeter rockets and 600 millimeter rockets have guidance systems. They're not as fully developed as uh, ICBMs or ballistic missiles, but they do have a guidance system and I'll get to that a little bit later. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. I'm gonna start with biological weapons and there's a great deal of inconsistency and uncertainty among the various estimates. So I have declined to give you any numbers about that. Uh, biological weapons can uh, be delivered through a wide variety of methods. As you see here, missiles, bombs, hand grenades, rockets, Spray tanks, I've underlined that for a reason that will become clear uh, toward the end of my part here. And land vehicles, watercraft, in case you were attacking uh, from the sea. So let's have another slide, please. Here are the North Korean biological weapons that uh, we are fairly certain they uh, have. I'm not going to go into those in detail. I'm not a medical doctor, not a virologist, but we do know that they have anthrax and it is the bio choice of, uh, because of this delivery, ease in delivery, uh, very easily packaged uh, as the other slide showed you. It has a great deal of persistence and longevity and it is very lethal. Uh, just for example, uh, you'll recall, let me see, check my notes here. Um, Back in 1982, the Japanese, 32, the Japanese started the program in Manchuria and they were very successful with that. Uh, <coughs> and in 2001, the United States, two United States senators and a host of other American officials uh, were sent letters laced with anthrax and a number of those recipients developed uh, anthrax. And I believe that five died. So without treatment, anthrax is a very fatal thing. Let's have the next slide, please. Now, the chemical weapons program is thought to have begun in the 1980s, as the slide, show, slide shows here. 
in the stockpiles, we have a number of estimates, but they're all very, very intimidating. 2,500 tons to 5,000 tons, that's a lot of chemical weapons. Uh, credible production estimates are very hard to come by, in part because we have a difficulty in detecting uh, the uh, production facilities. But it would be safe to say that any facility in North Korea that's producing uh, agricultural materials like fertilizer and so on could be easily converted to doing uh, chemical weapons. So next slide, please. Here are some of the delivery means that people uh, estimates have come up and, and put together. Uh, artillery shells, rockets, 2,400 tons. That's a lot, 800,000 rounds uh, for artillery uh, and rockets, ballistic missiles, 500 warheads, aircraft drones, special operations forces. Uh, that's a very broad uh, descriptor, but I'll get into that a little bit later. 150 tons, uh, the number of rounds really doesn't apply. Uh, aircraft drones and special operations forces have their own uh, methods of carrying those and delivering them. And then they have 300 tons in reserve and for replenishment. So let's go to the next slide, please. Here are the types of weapons that North Korea is suspected to have developed at least partially in the past and probably stand ready to deal with uh, today. Chlorine, phosgene, cyanide, mustard gas, sarin, summon, and VX. Uh, the sarin and the, soap, uh, the VX are highlighted because as Bruce pointed out, Sarin has been used quite effectively in Syria. Perhaps as many as 2,000 or more have died as a result of the sarin gas. Sarin also has been used in Tokyo in the mid-1990s by the occult group Aum and Shinraki, uh, and a number of people were killed there. The difficulty with the Tokyo attacks in the mid-90s was that the type of sarin used was a liquid. Uh, that's not the most effective way to deal with it. The most effective method of dealing with sarin uh, is uh, liquid, dis uh, sorry, spray dispersal, aerosol. So I'm going to get to that a little bit later too. And VX, VX is a nerve agent, just as is sarin. And we know that they use that. Uh, that's how uh, Kim Jong-un, the current ruler, ruler, had his half-brother, Kim Jong-nam, uh, assassinated at the Kuala Lumpur International Airport in Malaysia. This was back in, let me check my notes here. That was uh, 2017, I believe. Um, in any case, uh, the North Koreans had hired, <clears throat> excuse me, two young women. Uh, Kim Jong-nam is noted to have been a, a ladies' man. So they hired two rather attractive young Asian women. Each of them had uh, one of the binary agents that when combined make VX. One ran up and spread uh, one of the liquids on his face. Another lady had a handkerchief with the VX other agent, smeared it on his face, and they immediately adjourned to the restroom to wash their hands for their own personal safety. They were caught, but within just a very few minutes, uh, King Jung Nam was in his death throes. It's a very painful way to die. So if we could have the next slide, please. Now, the way that these can be delivered and the way uh, North Korea is looking into ways of delivery is unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, UAVs, we also call them drones. They do photo reconnaissance of South Korea to determine uh, the best targets. A little bit more on that in a bit. And they also uh, conduct practice routes for delivery of the biochemical uh, weapon systems. They have done that a lot. Uh, we also have uh, the North Koreans would be using helicopter-like drones. Um, I'll get a little bit more detailed in that on the next slide. They're going to be using the information gained from the Ukraine-Russian conflict. Uh, the drones over there are both the, what we see uh, as model aircraft style and also the helicopter style. And then we have the late 1940s era AN-2, it's called a Colt, uh, NATO code name Colt biplane. So if we could get the next slide, go into a little bit of detail on that. This is a North Korean drone that ran out of fuel and crashed just south of the DMZ, the demilitarized zone in South Korea uh, back in 2017. That thing has a payload of about two uh, kilograms, just about five pounds. 
a little bit more or less. Things have improved. These drones were equipped with cameras, Japanese cameras, and they were scanning uh, South Korean military facilities. They tried to get to one of the American terminal high altitude area defense CAD systems, uh, but they failed in that. But they've been taking pictures of the close to the South Korean presidency's uh, resident, residents, as well as other uh, important military and civilian structures. So next slide, please. These are the drones that are being used in Ukraine by the Ukrainians. You will see that they're rather small. We don't have any specs on them because they're built uh, out of spare parts by the hobbyists. As the title of the slide indicates, uh, they're used for racing. Well, now they're being used to deliver uh, bombs to the Russian forces. And if you've seen some of the videos available on YouTube and other places, they've been rather effective in, in doing that. The North Koreans are going to be undoubtedly working on doing this themselves. Uh, they don't have a way to uh, demonstrate that yet. They're continuing to use those smaller model airplanes to do reconnaissance. But now if we can get the next slide, please. This is that AN-2 uh, head-on shot. On Bruce's slide, it was an olive drab side shot. This is a biplane that has a, a heck of a payload, 4,700 pounds. It will handle eight special ops troops, as Bruce mentioned, uh, 10 paratroopers, 12 passengers. But the biggest thing that it's going to be used for is crop dusting hostile troops with biological or chemical weapons. You can see the on the lower wing there of the, the biplane, the nozzles for dispersing the aerosol. It's got a max speed of 160, so it can go low and slow. And when it gets ready to do what it's doing, uh, 30 miles an hour is its stall speed. Fully loaded, it's probably much higher than that, perhaps 40, 45 miles an hour. Uh, that is still too slow for American radars and rock radars to capture it very well. And if you can imagine what that could do, loaded with 4,700 pounds of sarin or VX aerosol, uh, running down the streets of Seoul or some other major city during rush hour, dropping these uh, droplets of highly contagious, I mean, highly uh, infectious and deadly materials on passengers waiting for buses, getting ready to come in go into or coming out of uh, subway tunnels uh, and just driving down the street. It's deadly. So that, uh, that by the way, uh, backing up a little bit, if we could go back two slides, that one. That was doing reconnaissance uh, for also for optical guidance, as I mentioned earlier, and Bruce talked about those 300 millimeter, 600 millimeter rockets. Those things have an optical guidance uh, detector on its nose and small uh, steerable fins on its rear. I cannot be sure, but I am offering my opinion that the one of the uses that will be made of those photographs will be to provide guidance for the rockets on specific South Korean military facilities. It doesn't take much to store a reference uh, picture in a handheld cell phone type device that the optical guidance device can reference. And so uh, this is something that people need to be uh, paying attention to. And yet most recently in one of the South Korean papers, uh, they're claiming that the North Korean drones pose no tactical or strategic threat. They're very, very mistaken in that. So now if we could go back two more slides, I mean, uh, go back that one and the next one, and that should conclude what I'm talking about here. Uh, let's go back to the previous slide and hang on to this slide for something later. And that concludes my part. Uh, now Q and A. Okay, um, I don't see myself yet, uh, but I will introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tiff Roberts. I'm a fellow at the Mansfield Center and also an instructor on China. Uh, in political science and history at the University of Montana. And I'm joining now to uh, moderate the questions directed uh, to our very interesting and, and dare I say, uh, 
frightening speakers uh, as they talk about North Korea. I'd like to start by uh, directing the first question uh, to Bruce. Um, my question is, uh, other than the very obvious uh, benefit of money and profit that the North Koreans are gaining from their very, very rampant proliferation, as you have clearly presented, are there any other benefits that they get from this, my diplomatic or otherwise, that also uh, encourages them to uh, develop these relationships through weapons with all these countries uh, in Africa and the Middle East? Well, in the Afri in Africa, no, it's all about money in Africa. And that's a good question. That's a good way of putting it. I like that. What did, uh, what did uh, Michael Douglas say in uh, Wall Street? Greed is good, right? So uh, you can <laughs> smile. Um, and I think he had a full jar of grease in his hair in that movie scene as well. But um, in Africa, that's really the driving force. In fact, in Africa, countries like Ethiopia and Mozambique, Tanzania, where I was in 2019, they actually have very strong relationships with the United States. Part of the problem is, after the Cold War, the United States didn't want to invest the money to help those guys. And this is Democrat and Republican. It's not really a political thing. Uh, they didn't want to invest the money to help those countries rebuild their militaries. Well, they were built around the Soviet infrastructure. That's how they built their militaries. So the Soviet Union went away. Russia wasn't selling them weapons they could afford. And countries like, uh, again, Mozambique, Namibia, um, uh, Tanzania, et cetera, continued to, and Ethiopia continued to buy Russian weapons only this time from the North Koreans. And uh, the North Koreans have actually built factories in, uh, in several of these countries. Uh, a good anecdotal story, this is actually in the Washington Post, I'd like to share with you. I think you'll find this fascinating. Um, you probably remember back in 2006 when we asked the Ethiopians for their help in going after Al Shabaab in uh, in um, in uh, in Somalia, going after the Somalian uh, several of the Somalian terror forces, they did that, but they needed new arms. So they asked us to take the pressure off North Korea for a few months, so North Korea would send them those arms they needed to buy from them, and the Bush administration did that. <laughs> so. It's, it's very interesting. So yes, in Africa, it's purely money. In the Middle East, it's largely money too. Um, again, um, Iran and North Korea, largely pariah states, as you know, um, which is why Iran has bought so many of its ballistic missile systems from North Korea. Nobody else would sell them to them. Um, I think that may be changing now. As you can see, you know, North uh, Iran's now selling drones to, to Russia. Maybe that means Russia will start selling uh, Iran uh, much more advanced missile systems than what the North Koreans can sell them. In fact, I think that's pretty likely. And I think China might might do some of that as well. So things will change, although cyber has brought in a, a, new, um, a new aspect of that. So money's a big deal there too. But it's also very important to understand Iran by far is North Korea's biggest customer. Two to three billion dollars a year. That dwarfs everybody else North Korea sells weapons to. And uh, I mean, if you're to talk about all those 12 countries I put up on that slide from Africa, that's probably less than 300 million a year. All of it. Now, that's a lot of money to North Koreans that you can use to bribe the elite and, you know, buy food for the military and fuel for the army and stuff like that. But it's dwarfed by Iran. But what they have in common with Iran, more than just money, is an ideological hatred of the United States. So all the publicity that we see, and, and I'm sure you've seen it too, and you're a China guy, so you know in China before, you know, before the, the, the big economic ties that we have now that started in the late 1970s, Ideologically, Chinese people were taught to hate the government of the United States, the great Satan. Iran's the same thing. Well, North Korea is the same thing, too. So giving these weapons to 
um, selling these weapons, I should say, because they don't give anything to anybody. Selling these weapons to Iran fits right in with that ideology of hating America and everything it stands for. Um, and so there, there's also that underlying anti-Israeli attitude um, amongst the Iran. Uh, amongst North Koreans, much as there is among, you know, the Iranians for different reasons, uh, but largely because the Americans support Israel. So uh, I would say, with the exception of Iran and maybe Syria as well, Hezbollah, Hamas, um, it's really all about money. It's cash and carry. Hope that answers your question. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'd like to direct the next question to Bob. Bob, you have written extensively about uh, China's relationship with North Korea. Uh, could you give us your your uh, uh, expert opinion on what role China could play in potentially moderating uh, North Korea's behavior, or is that not an option? I, I should say, in my years living in China as a journalist, foreign ministry officials used to like to tell us foreign journalists, we have no control over them. Uh, you, you Americans think we can tell the North Koreans what to do, but you know, they're, they, we, they don't listen to us. They're crazy. Um, and uh, this was back when the foreign diplomats in China were friendlier towards uh, uh, Americans and American journalists. That has changed. I, I never quite believed them on that. But anyway, what is your, uh, what is your, what, what do you have to tell us on that? What can, what role can China play? And maybe after you, I'd love to hear from Bob as, uh, from Bruce as well. Okay. Well, I kind of anticipated this, which is why that one oddball slide uh, popped up at the end. And if we could get that one, yes. You will see that that is North Korea there. There's Pyongyang. You see the blue lines of the Yalu River and the Tumen River. Uh, and just north of that, you'll see some darker gold-colored stuff. Uh, those are Korean autonomous regions. Koreans themselves historically have come out of Northeast China and down into the Korean Peninsula. And over time, various Korean dynasties have occupied those areas outlined in that nice golden uh, color there. They remain there today, even though China officially controls those three provinces, Liaoning, Jilin, and Heilongjiang. Uh, pardon my pronunciation there, Tiff, you could probably do a better job. But the fact remains that those there are close to 2 million North Koreans in this area, and they represent a threat to the internal security of China. Uh, if something were to go south in North Korea, pardon the pun, if you know, I'll rephrase, if North Korea were to implode and suffer a great deal of unrest, that would likely spread to the Koreans, uh, ethnic Koreans in those Northeastern Chinese provinces. And that would be a tremendous thorn in China's side. For that reason, and for the reason that China itself does not want South Korea's democratic, highly capitalistic, free democracy on its northeastern doorstep. So for those two reasons, if nothing else, uh, North Korea is something that China is going to prop up politically, monetarily, whatever it takes. There was a time after the Korean War when uh, Soviet Union was North Korea's uh, greatest a patron, but that changed in the 60s when China took over that. And now it comes down to who is going to give North Korea the better deal. Uh, North Korea plays, uh, the, plays both parties quite well. If they can get something from Russia, they will be friendly with Russia. If they can get something from China, they will be friendly with Beijing. With regard to your statement that China uh, foreign ministry people claim that they have no control over North Korean behavior, to a very large degree, that is the case. I don't have the, the dates in mind, uh, but they can be easily verified. A couple of years ago, China was having a major, major party conference, and yet North Korea set off its, uh, one of its uh, more recent uh, nuclear detonation. That was a thumb on the nose to Xi Jinping, uh, and that was noted. Uh, North Korea will do what it takes to preserve itself. It does not see itself as a little brother to the bigger brother that China likes to call itself in their bilateral relations. North Korea is very much a wild card. And to the degree that 
uh, they cannot be controlled, then the Chinese foreign ministers and their personnel are accurate. China, however, can influence them to some degree. Um, Xi Jinping has made appeals behind the scenes to North Korea to not make any more nuclear detonations. That's one of the reasons why uh, we haven't seen one, although the uh, <coughs> consensus seems to be that they're ready. Uh, they are, but there's a problem with the nuclear uh, test site being polluted with nuclear uh, radiation, and that may be another factor. But to the main point, China has very little control over what North Korea does, says, or wants to do. And for that reason, any people in the United States that look to China to help the United States control North Korea, I think are engaging in a pipe dream. We need to rid ourselves of that Pollyanna-ish uh, wishful thinking. China is going to do what it takes to further its own goals. One of those is to keep North Korea as a buffer between it and South Korea and keep it stable enough so that it does not ignite any ethnic unrest in its Northeastern provinces. That's Thank you. Uh, Bruce, did you have, would you like to add anything to that? Well, I, a couple of things, just, uh, I mean, and you're an old China hand, so you know this, I think China has more influence over the government of the DPRK than anybody else, which is to say not very much. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, the, the North Koreans listen to the Chinese and the Chinese have helped them out economically. Um, but I, I mean, I, I think doing a compare and contrast here, you know, when I was a graduate student at Catholic University way back in the 1990s, I had Dr. Enrique Umar, who taught me intro to poli sci at the graduate level. And he always used to say, compare contrast, compare contrast. So if you were going to compare contrast on um, uh, North Korea's relationship with the Soviet Union during the Cold War and North Korea's relationship with China, <clears throat> it's really stark because the Soviet Union literally subsidized North Korea for everything they needed. As you know, it wasn't just North Korea, it was Cuba, it was the Warsaw Pact, it was countries like Ethiopia and Mozambique. And, uh, you know, 1990, that stopped. And the difference between what they did and what the Chinese do now is the Chinese give them just enough to creep by. You know what I'm saying? So, um, it's really a very different relationship than the Russians had, or the Soviets, I should say, had with the North Koreans, and the Chinese have less influence, but they still have more than anybody else. Um, and, you know, Bob gave you an anecdotal uh, story about e exploding a nuke. The second nuke that North Korea tested, it tested their first in 2008, the second one they tested in 2009 they called the Chinese an hour before they tested it to tell them they were going to do it. At least they called them, right? I mean, they didn't call us. <laughs> but I mean, as I as I said, they listen to the Chinese when they think they have to, I think. Um, the Chinese go out of the way to protect them. That is the last bastion against the only remaining part of the Asian landmass where American troops are still stationed. And as long as there is a PRC, I think that's gonna be a priority with uh, the government in China. And I thought what Bob said and what you said were, were great. All right, well, uh, we've, we've been offered a, a few extra minutes, but I think we just have time for probably one more question, which I could address to both of you. And so I'm gonna choose an enormously large question, which. Uh, uh, which maybe you could, one could write a dissertation on. But in, in any case, uh, the U.S. has regularly calls uh, North Korea a rogue nation. Uh, former President Bush famously or infamously uh, listed North Korea as part of the axis of evil, along with Iran and Iraq. Uh, North Korea, for its part, constantly refers to the imperialist aggressor and likes to say that they will annihilate their enemies, which I believe they said just a day or two ago again. Uh, usually uh, referring probably to the U.S. as their number one foe. So is there, what room is there, if, if there is any, 
for the US and North Korea to find some room to negotiate? I told you it'd be a big question. Why don't I start with you, Bruce? So you're asking what, what can we do to negotiate um, with the North Koreans? It, it may surprise you when I say this, but I, I think we should be talking to the North Koreans. I'm not saying we should give them what they want, but I think things are always better when we're talking than they're not, when we're not talking. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> um, what the North Koreans want right now more than anything else is sanctions relief. The sanctions are killing them. And um, as long as we're not going to engage in talks with them that actually relieve those sanctions, they're not going to give us anything we want. But, but, or as the Koreans would say, Kurunde. Um, but what we need to understand as Americans is they're not going to give us what we want anyway. Um, as you saw in one of my slides, when it comes to talks with the North Koreans, for one thing, all that stuff that Bob and I talked about, besides the nuclear program, all we ever talk about is the nuclear program. We don't talk about all the other threats North Korea poses to the region and to us and to our allies because we never get past the nuclear talks. So, uh, you know, um, the big problem with them is they're willing to talk to us, they're willing to take some of the things that we offer to them but they're always going to walk away when it comes time for us to, to ensure that they're actually complying with what we've asked them to do. They've done that every time since the agreed framework, excuse me, in 1994. Something we need to keep in mind, on the other hand, as the Biden administration has said, the door is open. I think we should be talking to them. So hopefully we'll see that happen in the near future. Thanks. Bob, what would you like to add to that? Well, I think Bruce has made some excellent, excellent points there. I wrote a paper that was eventually picked up by uh, the British House of Lords, for goodness sake, in which I made the point that uh, the North Koreans won't talk to us until they want something. And as soon as we start talking with them, they will engage with us, but they will continue to engage with us only so long as they think something will come out of it to benefit them. As soon as it becomes clear to them that they're not going to get what they want, then it, they make it clear to us they're walking away and we certainly don't get what we want. Now, Bruce is absolutely right. We get hung up on the nukes. Uh, that's not going anywhere. It's been codified in their constitution. They talk about it all the time. They've passed laws. We might as well speak to them as though they are a nuclear power. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say something very unkind. And that is, we need to get past this diplomatic fiction that North Korea is not a nuclear power. They are. We negotiated detente with the Soviet Union when they first developed nuclear weapons. Eventually, we did the same thing with communist China. It is time to engage North Korea on that uh, subject. Now, to continue uh, engaging with them on detente does not mean talking about giving up the nukes. I don't think that's ever, ever going to happen. But we can talk about giving them safeguards. How is your command and control, dear uh, comrade Kim? Do you have ways to prevent your un, uh, unhappy admirals and, and uh, generals from setting them off or doing something untoward? How do you control? We ought to be giving them assistance to manage their nuclear program. We can also talk about a number of other things. Uh, unification of separated families. That's a problem though that's going to go away probably in another 15, 20 years as those people that survived uh, the separation of the states in the, during the Korean War die off. But these are things that we can talk about. We can talk about improving the life of the average Korean, North Korean. As Bruce mentioned, it's four inches uh, shorter in height, 12 years uh, less in lifespan. Uh, those North Korean soldiers that made it through the DMZ uh, some years ago were riddled with, with rickets and, and tapeworms. Uh, the country's in horrible condition. Uh, they're going to undergo another famine. These are things we can talk with them if, talk about with them if we understand that we are not going to get 
what everybody is talking about. The State Department continues to say denuclearization is our goal. Uh, I think that's foolish. All right. Well, um, I'm afraid we've gone well beyond our allotted time this evening. So I'm going to uh, stop our uh, uh, fascinating and frightening uh, uh, dialogue now. Um, I want to thank uh, both of our speakers for uh, what was an, a very illuminating and, as I say, a little bit scary presentation on uh, North Korea. I'd also like to thank our audience for attending. Um, if you and the audience direct your attention to the chat, you can find a link to sign up to get uh, notified of our future events at the Mansfield Center. So uh, please go ahead and do that. We're going to have uh, many more uh, interesting dialogues going forward. So again, thank you to everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone.